Well, once again, good morning. We are excited that you are spending some time with us, and we had a, a great 9 a.m. experience this morning, so we believe that uh, this one will be even better, as long as well as the noon crowd, but this is the, this is the um, crazy crowd, right? <laughs> Both of you are crazy, okay. <laughs> we, we are actually right in the middle of a, a series that we are calling Family Over Everything. And that phrase, family over everything, is kind of a battle cry that a few years ago our staff developed. And we, we basically said it's going to be unity and family over everything. Our hearts are connected. We're not going to let anything divide that. And so not only do I feel like it needs to be the rallying cry of just our team, it needs to be ra- the rallying cry of our church. And so we are doing a series on unity. And we'll have three more weeks in this series. And so they'll each build on each other and they'll get better and better and better and better. So uh, I've been using this quote, which I've been kind of rolling around in my heart for the last few weeks. And the quote is uh, by Pastor Jimmy Evans. And he said this, that the greatest perversion of creation is independence. The greatest perversion of creation is independence. In other words, the way God made us is we need to be dependent on one another. First of all, we need to be in total dependence on God, which we understand. And then we need to have a healthy dependence on the right relationships in our life. And I say right relationships because um, that would be our spouse. That would be our brothers and sisters in Christ. And then we need to have a vital dependence on the local church. And I see you all passing the red containers. So there are red containers over here. If you want to follow along and take notes, just grab one of those out and you can take notes. And we have a little saying that note takers are history makers. They say that um, within 72 hours, you forget everything I'm going to say to you this morning. So um, that makes me feel awesome. But other than that, we just uh, give you a chance to write it down. You don't have to take notes, but uh, there are notes provided there for you. And so we've been talking about this, uh, this idea of, of, of unity and dependence. <clears throat> and the Bible says in Ephesians, it says it this way, endeavor to keep the unity. It doesn't say anywhere in the Bible to get into unity but it does say keep the unity. So when you become a Christ follower, you're, you are automatically put into family. But the Bible says we have to guard that. We have to protect. The word endeavor means we give great focus, we give great concentration, and we give great energy and effort into doing what? Keeping unity. If you're not operating in unity, guess what? You're operating in disunity. The Bible actually calls that chaos. Another word for chaos is the word confusion. And the word confusion, we know that's the devil's playground is confusion. Now, if the leadership and the people of a church, um, if, if they are upholding themselves morally, if they're teaching right doctrine, and if they are doing the right things with your finances, which we do here, then the devil can't come through the front door. So what does the devil do? He tries to access the back door and bring schisms and disunity and things of that nature. And so we learned in week number one, we need to be protecting family over everything, and we need to be protecting the unity of our church and the unity uh, uh, of being brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to protect that because there's going to be some things and some ones who will try to do what? Bring disunity. Disunity means you diss the unity. And so there are people, and we've learned this, that when God wants to bring a blessing, guess what he does? He walks someone into your life. When he wants to bring a curse into your life, guess what he does? The devil walks someone into your life, right, to bring this disunity. And so we learned in week one we need to protect that, protect against offense. And then last week we talked about how to promote unity, and we learned about being uh, uh, an encourager last week. So if you missed a couple weeks, you can go online, you can go on the church app, and you can, you can, you can watch that. Um, so we obviously know how important it is to be in unity, and that sounds so shallow, but it's one of the deepest truths we can get from learning about the church in, in the Bible. But here's one thing I want us to make sure that we, that we understand. In our passion to be unified, we can never become exclusive or, u- or inclusive. In other words, it can't be just us and no more. How many know if it's healthy, it will always what? 
grow. It will always increase. And so this morning, for a few moments, I want to talk to you about increasing family over everything. And if something is increasing, that means it's growing larger, it has greater capacity, there's greater in size, and there is greater in amount. And so um, I just wanted to give you this challenge before I jump into everything. And I'm going to talk about increasing unity, increasing family over everything. And we're going to look at where the church started and share a couple things with you. And I've got three pointers with you that I think will help you today. I'm going to teach you a little bit more than I preach you this morning, I think. We'll just see how that goes. Um, but but our church has, has been some good things happening. You know, up until summer, summer people kind of on vacations and everywhere, our church hit the number 500 a couple of times, which is a great thing. We, we knocked on that door, and usually by the time we get to the end of this month, we're, we're, we're going to keep growing and increasing again. And I just wanted to challenge you with that. I want you to help us grow, and I want you to help us increase this fall. Our goal is to um, to fill up our, this, this service is, is pretty crowded. We probably have room for a few more people in here, but uh, we got a little bit more room in our first and in, in, in our second, and so we want uh, you to help us fill up our church, and we want to add another service and move on to another facility, and it, it's kind of a religious thinking to think, well, they'll just show up. Uh, everyone's not walking around out there just looking for a place to go, and it's crazy to think, well, let's just call them in. That, that's not how this works. You don't call them in. You bring them in. And so I just want to give you a, a message today about how all of us can do that. And I want to bring us back to the roots of just uh, really being people that care about um, other people. Now, you say, well, um, you're just talking about numbers. Are numbers important in a church? Yes. God wrote a whole book called what? Numbers. It's in the Old Testament. So numbers are important, but they're not everything. We got to keep that in perspective. But I'm not just talking about upward numbers. I'm talking about outward numbers. That, that um, there are some people that God's put you around that you may be the connecting block to them and a relationship with God. Now you say, well, you don't have to be in church to have a relationship with God. Well, the Bible teaches that differently. That, that being in church is a part of the package. Right? Now, just because you're in church doesn't mean you're following Christ. But um, that, that relationship is with the church is part of your relationship with Jesus. Now, okay, now that you're all woman fuzzy about that, let's, uh, let's get going here. So <clears throat> I'm going to read to you Acts chapter 2, and this is right where the church started in Acts chapter 2. And I, I'll put it this way. What I'm about to read to you is the honeymoon stage of the church. Peter just preached a sermon and a few thousand people got born again. They got water baptized. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. And this is where the church started. And it was kind of like the honeymoon stage. Um, now I want you all to think with me. Remember the honeymoon? Some of you might have to think really far back. Some of you might have to think really hard. Remember the honeymoon stage? Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm trying to forget. No, think back. Actually, uh, uh, today is our 23rd wedding anniversary. <clears throat> and she is still crazy about me. <laughs> Told the first crowd, I've got the microphone, I've got the last word. No, I'm, I'm crazy about her. I'm very blessed. But remember the honeymoon stage, right? So everything was awesome. Everything was great. Um, you didn't see the flaws yet. Everything it was just kind of like you're in the clouds. You're just walking around in the fog. That's usually the honeymoon stage. And so the church is going through that stage. But I do believe this, though, sometimes the emotion and sometimes the feelings can kind of come and go, but it's the principles of the passion that we find in the honeymoon stage that should carry on. Amen? So there are things like you, you may be more used to your spouse, you may be around them more, so some of that may be a little more routine, but there's principles from that honeymoon stage you can always keep with you. Same thing with the church. So, so look at this, Acts chapter 2. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship. They broke bread and in prayers. And fear or awe or reverence came on every person. There were many wonders and there were many signs that were done through the apostles. Now, all of those who believed they were together and they had all things, what? In common. They actually sold their possessions and their goods. They divided them among anyone who had a need. So they continued on a daily basis in one accord in the temple. They broke bread house to house. They ate food with gladness and simplicity of heart. In verse 47, look what it says. Praising God, they had favor with all people. And the Lord added to their church daily as people were becoming saved. 
Now we see that they did church on a daily basis. This is, this is Jesus had just left and Jesus said, I'm going to go. My spirit's going to be on my people. He's going to remind them of the things that they were that, that I did and that I said. So we see the church begins to emerge. Peter gave an altar call. There's about 3,000 plus people. They're being born again every day. There's this passion. They're meeting every day in the temple. And then they met in houses. They're doing communion. They're sharing meals together. If somebody had a need, they would sell their own property to help that person in need. There was this common unity. And, and, and the Bible said this, that there was a reverence that came over them and signs, wonders, and miracles were happening. And they grew in favor with people around them and Jesus kept adding to the church on a daily basis I, I see three factors or I'll call them three passions that were on the disciples that I want to make sure we we keep those ablaze in our life and the first one is this they had a passion for revelation they had a passion for revelation the Bible said every day they would put themselves under the apostles teaching now, first of all, the apostles were the disciples. At this time, there were no Bibles, right? The Bible hadn't been, um, it hadn't been written yet, so they didn't have a Bible. They were walking and living witnesses of everything they saw. So people would come to the disciples. They began to teach everything that they remember, that the Spirit reminded them that Jesus taught. So here's, here's what happened. They had been born again, water baptized, filled with the Spirit, but yet they needed to continue to have what? Revelation. This is the thing that you and I need to continue to have in our walk with Jesus is this one word, revelation. The word revelation means there was a curtain and you opened the curtain and it was always there but now it's exposed to you. It would be like this, um, th there was a lid on something and the lid was taken off or it was dark and the lights came on. I believe this revelation, this is my definition, it's a wow moment. It's when you get revelation on something and you go, wow, that's good. It may happen on a Sunday morning where we say something. It may, be, it may happen through the week where you hear a message or you're just reading the Bible and all of a sudden you just have a, or God speaks to you and you're like, wow. Anyone had a revelation moment? You just had a wow moment. Did you ever get a wow moment when you heard about grace? Did you ever have a wow moment when you learned about faith? How about this? Did you ever have a wow moment when you realized that God's a healer and you don't have to be sick? Did you ever have a wow moment when you realize that God wants to prosper you and you don't have to be broke? See, religion didn't give you any wow moments, but a relationship with Jesus will. But see, they had this passion that drove them to God's house on a daily basis because they just wanted what? Revelation. They just wanted to continue to learn the things of God, and they were getting this from the apostles. They would teach them the things of Jesus because the Bible says Jesus and the Word are the same thing, right? Jesus and the Word. This book is basically Jesus written down, right? The New Testament, Jesus and the Word, they're the same thing. And so they were getting revelation from the disciples. There was a hunger for it. And I want to challenge you with this. Don't ever let your hunger for revelation ever wane. The moment it starts to happen, you'll start to isolate and drift. Now think about this. There are some very important things I believe that I'm supposed to teach in our church. I'm supposed to teach you a lot about grace. I'm supposed to teach you a lot about faith. I'm supposed to teach you a lot about healing, prospering, the spirit of God. These are deeper things I'm supposed to teach you. Now, if you fail or if you stop hearing those particular topics, you'll start to drift from those. And you'll, once you start drifting, you start doubting. Even though you love Jesus, you'll start to doubt. If you don't keep hearing about healing, you'll start to drift from it, and you'll question if God really wants you healed. And if you start to question if God really wants you healed, it's hard to be healed. If you stop, if you stop hearing about grace and the favor of God, you'll start to drift from it. And you'll start to doubt it. Instead of living, instead of realizing you live by the favor of God, you'll start thinking you live by luck, by chance. Are you with me? If you stop hearing about the fact that God wants to prosper your finances, that you're blessed to be a blessing, if you stop hearing that, you will drift from it and you'll start doubting if God wants you blessed. This is why it's important to have what? Revelation. The Bible actually says this, without revelation, my people what? Perish. It actually means this. You can study that scripture in, in, in Hosea, and it actually means this. Some of God's people died premature because they didn't get revelation on healing. Some of God's people stay broke because they didn't get revelation on what? Blessing. 
Some marriages, guess what? They struggle because they don't understand that if they have revelation from the word, that's what makes it work. Are you with me? So they had this passion. If you have passion for something, it's a priority. So they had this priority on revelation. I want to challenge you. Keep getting revelation. Keep getting here on Sunday and keep getting revelation. Tune in. Watch the right people on- online or on TV. And I'm, I mean, watch the right people. Because some people will preach you something else. It'll talk you out of your blessing. It'll talk you right back into religion. It will, it'll talk you. And religion is just man's attempt to get the favor of God. You, you get the favor of God, you receive it by faith. Amen? So there could be some preachers who will teach you out of, they'll teach you out of your healing. They'll teach you out of your process. Are y'all with me this morning? Y'all are quiet. Now, the nine o'clock was more rowdy than you. I don't understand that because it was cold outside this morning. Uh, but, but so we, we got to have a passion for revelation. When you open your Bible, got to have some passion for revelation, right? So you got to keep that stirred up. That's what was happening in the original church. All these people got saved. They got filled with the Holy Spirit. They got uh, uh, water baptized. And now they realized they had to keep getting revelation. Second passion that they continued to have to have is the passion for community. They had a passion for community. The Bible actually says this, that on a daily basis, they went to the temple, they prayed, and they worshiped. They learned the word. Then they went house to house talking about the word. And then they did communion. And then they broke bread. And then if somebody had a need, they would sell something. And they would help each other out. In other words, there was a spirit of connection. There was a spirit of community, common unity. They had one heart. They had one vision. They were all on the same page. They didn't have their personal agendas. And God was, the Bible said, because of that, signs, wonders, miracles, there was a reverence that fell on people because they were in unity. And I said this a moment ago, but if you're not operating in unity, you're operating in what? Disunity. And you know, if God's called you to this church and you're planted in this church, there's things you need to hear me teach or one of us teach on a Sunday to break some religion off you. And you need to hear some things that keep you in unity. We can't have a bunch of people with their own agendas, right? Because that, that creates disunity. But this common, this is why we have our groups. This is why we have our man up, our destined gatherings. This is why we do things like that. Because on a daily basis, they would meet. They would have a big meeting at the temple. That They would have their, their groups that would meet. And they actually did communion every day. Now, later on, this stuff began to happen on a weekly basis. Like the Bible says this, as often as you do communion, do it what? In reverence. Do it in remembering. We actually do it about once a month. Usually at the end of every series, we'll do it, we'll do it here at the church. We'll do it once a month. The Bible just says often as you, you can do it every day at home if you want to. I would encourage you, do it, do it at home. You don't have to come here and I don't have to hand you the stuff and do it. You can do it at home. You should do it, right? There are seasons to go through. You should do it more frequently than other. The Bible just says do it as often. But there was this, there was this, they had a passion to, to get revelation and they had a passion to be in common unity, to be in connection. Now, let, let, let me say this to you. You can't be in common unity and you can't be in connection if you're not in God's house regularly. Now, we learned last week, Hebrews says this, when you see the day approaching, you'll see many people starting to just be out of church. Statistically, I've, you've heard me say this, but statistically, they say uh, um, right now, statistically, that um, the average person is in church about two times a month the regular attender. People used to be in church two to three times a week. And listen, I know life's crazy, but I would just challenge you with this. Actually, Sunday actually is not your day. It actually says it's the Lord's day. I didn't write that. I didn't write the Bible, y'all know that? It actually says it's the Lord's day. What are you doing with the Lord's day? A lot of us start thinking, well, it's the end of the week. No, it's actually day one. It's actually day one. It's the Lord's day. You want to start your week off right? Start it in God's house. Now, I want to challenge you. In the days approaching, that means the days that are dangerous, the days that are distracting, and the days that are deceptive, you need to be in the house of God because that's where the victory is happening, in the house of God. If you stay out of the house of God, you, you, you're looking for your victory somewhere else, I, I'm afraid that you're, you're probably not going to be able to, um, to find it. I uh, read this really interesting study this, this past week, and they did a, a study of former um, American um, prisoners of war, 
And they wanted to find out what was the most breaking thing that happened to them as far as torture went that broke them down. And they, they discovered, what they discovered actually was amazing. They discovered this, that the physical torture was not what wore them down. Isolation was what wore them down. And, and they went on and this, they did this research and they found this out that even above a prisoner of war, even above their commitment to their country, and even above their love for the cause that they were fighting for, the most damaging thing was when they began to break them up from their brothers that they were fighting with. So it was more about the, the brothers and arms that were around them than even the bigger picture. And that's amazing to think. And what do you think that the devil tries to do to us? If he can get you isolated, if he can get you on your own, if he can get you into your opinions, then guess what? An isolated, have you, have you ever been watching the Animal Channel and, uh, and you see a, a wounded or a sick or a weak animal get away from its pack, guess what? He's easy prey. Don't let the devil talk you into becoming easy prey. Don't let him let you get full of offense. Don't let him get off to the side. Don't let him let you get beat down because if he does, you're easier to pick off. Amen. Are you with me? So they had a passion for this common unity and they had a passion for this revelation. And there's something else that I see that I want to camp on. And it's this, they had passion for influence. They had passion for influence. And the reason why I picked that word is because, let me just put it this way, let's make it sound churchy, to have an effective witness. They had a passion to have an effective witness or to have influence. Influence is just persuasion. The reason I say that is because the Bible said that they, were, they grew or they increased in favor with people. In other words, people were attracted to what was happening by the way they were conducting their lives, by their passion for revelation, by their passion for community, and by their passion for influence. And the Bible said people grew in favor with them, and Jesus did something on a daily basis. He just kept adding people. Here's what I believe. I believe God wants to add some people here, because I believe there are some people that need to hear about grace, and I believe there's some people that need to hear about faith. And I, need, I believe there's some people that need to hear that the last days are God's days. I believe there's some people that, that are broke that need to learn about blessing. I believe there's some people who are sick that need to be healed. And I said this, I think, a moment ago. But just to say, well, they'll just come in doesn't happen that way. The Bible tells us to bring them in. And so I believe that the early church had this intensity or this focus or this endeavor to what? Bring people in to make sure they were influencing people. Now sometimes I believe this, that there's this little whisper in your ear because when I talk about this topic, I think all of us that love Jesus, we wanna be a good witness. We wanna see people come to church. We wanna see people freed. We wanna see people, but there's always this voice that goes a little bit like this. Well, you're not perfect enough or you don't know enough scriptures to talk to people or witness or you don't have it all together yourself or no one would want to come to church with you. Are you crazy? Or they're going to do something weird if they come to church. Those are all things that get whispered in our ears. I just want you to know those are just lies. The devil will whisper things in your ears to keep you from just being a person who brings people to church. So what I want to do is I want to share these three very simple things with you that will help your influence. Now, this is just some teaching this morning, right? Um, we'll shout amen a little more next week, but these, these are very simple. If you want to, anyone want to just increase your influence? I would love to increase my influence. So here's three things, right? One, commit to conversation. Commit to conversation. Now, I know some of you are a conversation waiting to happen. And some of us, we don't like to talk as much. But I believe there's a key I'm going to give you to help give you greater influence about conversation. If you talk to people about their favorite subject, you'll be a master, uh, you'll be a master com conversationalist. What's everyone's favorite subject? Themselves. <laughs> no, seriously, think about this. Everyone's favorite subject is what? It's themselves. If you talk about your kids, what's the next thing coming? How about this? Someone, someone's talking about their kids. And what's the first thing you think? Well, my kids are better looking than yours. My kids are more awesome than yours. Okay, let's make it make more sense. How many have grandkids? Someone's talking about their grandkids, and you're like, nah. 
you have no clue what you're talking about, right? Because my grandkids, they're the bomb, right? People love to talk about themselves. The greatest way to gain influence is, guess what? Talk to people about themselves. Makes conversation easy. Um, Remember Jesus sat down at a well and a Samaritan woman came to him. And Jesus, being the Messiah, still engaged her in conversation about what? Herself. I want to challenge you to practice this principle of just talking to people about themselves. This is why I say to have, uh, uh, to be effective, we, we don't need, we don't have to know the entire, you do not have to get up here, you do not have to be able to draw all the charts from the book of Revelations, okay? Uh, but what you do is you've got to be able to just to be willing to what? Have a conversation. Now, this, this is a, a principle that, that a few months ago, I, I, I am off this stage, I am not this loud and obnoxious. I, I'm rather quiet. So to strike up conversation is not my easiest thing. But I began just to practice this principle, and it, you'd be amazed at what it does, is it opens the doors to people's hearts. I Just a few weeks ago, me and my father went camping. We were up in the mountains, and at the campground, they had this little guy on a little 4 by 4 that drove around. He ran the campground. And uh, when we kind of checked in, he mentioned to me that he is a retired musician. So there was my inroad to have a conversation. So he came by our camp. I walked out to the road, and I engaged him with this conversation. I said, so you used to be a musician. I said, you play, you know, with anybody famous? He named like, he's like, oh, yeah, he named like three groups. I'm like, I've never heard of those groups before. <laughs> but then he, he named one, and, and some of you will remember this, a little old school, Linda Ronstadt. Yeah, half of you are like, nope. <laughs> well, for that half of you that did, there was a popular singer back in the day, and he was her guitarist. So I just began to ask questions after question after question just to show interest. Now, here's what happened. About three times a day, he would drive by our camp and stop that four by four. And I would walk out, and I would just ask him questions. And he just began to tell me story after story. He had crazy stories. So, I mean, he was an old rock and roll hippie. So there was, I'm sure there's a few he didn't tell me. And he was, I didn't hear a few stories. But anyways, the point to that was, what if we were more engaged that way? He actually brought me some free wood, some extra wood just, just for, now I like to tell you, you know, hey, he came to Jesus and fell on the ground and the Holy Spirit fell and miracles happened. And it didn't quite get to that point. But the point was, that's a principle that anybody in this room can practice. Talk to somebody about their favorite subject. Second thing is not only committing to conversation, but is it's this, is being a bringer. Being a bringer. Um, the word invite, we could, you, we could use that word. Invite means come and see. Remember Jesus? I said, Jesus, where are you staying? And Jesus invited them. He said what? Come and see where I'm staying. Jesus was always an inviter. Now, listen to this statistic. They say this, that six out of ten people would go to church with you if you would ask them. That's 60, probably 60-some 60 percent of people would say yes to going to church with you if you would ask. Now listen to this statistic. 86 to 87 percent of Christians never invite anybody to church. So do the math. The majority of them would come, but the majority of us won't ask. And Jesus kept saying, invite, come and see, come and see. Now, I believe if we're doing a good job with conversation, at some point, we can do a really good job of inviting. Now, I think our church does a great job. Some of you do amazing. Some of you just invite everybody. But don't let your personality be your excuse. You know, like, well, I'm not that, I'm just not, you know, I'm, I'm quiet. I'm, I'm shy. Quit speaking that over yourself. Because 60% of them are probably, uh, 60% of people are waiting on the church to say, come and see. Come and see our common unity. Come and see our revelation. Come and see what God's doing. And okay, I, and I know the thoughts. Well, I've been a Jesus follower for 23 years, and I don't have any friends that aren't in church. Maybe you go, need to go find one. Now, listen to me. A lot of Sundays I get up here, I just preach you, teach you. But I want you to know I'm preaching and teaching to myself also this week. 
Let's get back to the roots. Get back to the basics, I guess. And I just want to challenge you, over the next few months, like I said, we, we, want, to, we want to increase the people that are coming here. We want to increase. I, I believe this. Our job is to preach the kingdom. Jesus adds. But he does it through, guess who? Us. You've heard me say this. When God wants to bless you, he walks a somebody into your life. When the devil wants to curse you, he walks a somebody into your life. When God wants to bless somebody, what if he wants to walk you into their life? What if it's you he wants to walk into your life? So at some point, I, now, let me say this. I believe with all of my heart, there are times and places for great outreach. Matter of fact, this summer, we did a night where we went to the apartment complexes over here. We did a big night. We did some giveaways. We loved on people. We used that to bridge the next week where we, where we bust the kids over here for camp. Then we took a whole Saturday and we served at the boys' ranch, and those things are very important. But listen to me, still the most effective way to reach people is through relationship. I mean, rallies and things, outreaches, they're good, but the best way is for you to have one-on-one -on -one influence. Doesn't mean the other's not appropriate, but it's still the best way. Create conversation, will be willing to become a bringer, and here's the last one, and maybe just as important, is share your story. So how do I influence people? Well, you just start being a conversationalist. You start being willing just to, who could I invite? And be willing to share your story. All right, let me give it a Jesus word or church word. Your testimony. Or to be a witness. Witness just means this. Someone who has seen and someone who has heard. That's why they were going to the disciples or the apostles when the church started. Because they wanted to get around someone who had seen Jesus and who had heard Jesus. And they were there. They got the t-shirt. They got the video. They want somebody. Now listen. Everybody in here, you have a story. If you are a Christ follower, you have a life change story. But, but, but don't let that little voice talk you out of it. Because here's why. That little voice sometimes says things like this. You have to have certain, you have to have like the book of Revelations memorized. You have to have your theology perfect. You have to have the, and really all you got to have is a Jesus story. That Listen, here's all I know. I was pretty jacked up. My marriage was a mess. My body was a wreck. I was addicted to this. I was in fear. I was in depression. I was just lost. I was living wrong. But Jesus took me right where I was at, graced my life, loved me, forgave me. And you know what? Day by day, I am changing into the image he made of me to be. That's your story. Your story's different than my story. And you don't have to make up a story like I killed like four people by the time I was 14. You don't have to have that for extra impact. <laughs> but what's your story? See, here's the deal. Nobody can take your story away from you. When it's all said and done, it's your story. It's what Jesus did. That's why I said, sometimes we feel like we have to have like all of these perfect words. You just gotta have your story. And there is somebody in your life, in your cubicle, in your workspace, in your school, in your neighborhood, and it may be the person you keep praying, God, would you please move them? Just move them away. I claim it, move them in Jesus' name. Maybe they haven't moved yet because God put you in their sphere to be the one to influence them. Let me give you a couple of scriptures. Acts chapter 22, verse 15. For you, everybody say me, will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and what you have heard. Look at Acts chapter 4, verse 20. For we cannot but speak the things that we've seen and we've heard. What if our passion was a little more like that? We're his witness and we can't help but just tell you what he's done for me. Jesus actually said this. They were trying to figure out if Jesus was the Messiah. And Jesus said this. He says, go tell John the things you saw, the things you heard, the blind they see, the lame they walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf they hear, the dead are raised, the poor have the gospel preached. In other words, Jesus is saying this. He said, what you've seen, what you've heard, you're a witness of these things. Let me say it this way. This book, how many would agree with this? This book contains amazing potential. 
This book, the Bible said Jesus and the word are the same. This is the book of Jesus. These are the promises of Jesus. And this book contains an amazing amount of capacity to change one's life. But if this book is unread or untold, it's just another book sitting on another shelf. That's how your life is. It contains great potential and it contains great capacity. But unless your story is told, it's just another life sitting on a shelf asking God, use me one day, use me one day, use me one day. And God says, you got a story to tell. That's how I will use you. Listen to me. Every time your mouth is opened and every time your uh, life is put into action, there is a gospel seed that goes forth when you're sharing your story or when you're serving. And the Bible says this, no word from God or seed from God will ever come back to you void. In other words, here's my point. When you're telling your gospel story, when you're telling your life change story, that's your capacity, that's your story being released, and whoever you release it on, think about this, the majority of them are willing to receive it. It will come back with effect. The devil keeps telling you to be quiet. No one wants to hear it. The devil keeps telling you, you, you don't have a story. You don't have a good enough testimony. You don't know enough of the Bible. You haven't done this perfect. He's trying to silence your story. Even if you're a little bit shy, every time you, the Bible says this, you are the salt and you are the light. Let me give you different words there. The Bible says this, you are the words and the actions of Jesus. Salt means words, light means actions. And it doesn't say you represent God. It says you are the words and the light of the gospel. What Jesus has to do, guess who he has to do it through? Let's all stand. So at the bottom of your little card, there's a space there. And this is what I would ask you. Over the next few months, who could you ask God to put on your heart to begin to build a, a walk with so you could bring them to church. Because I, I believe that through your story and through a few services here, God will change their heart. Actually, I guarantee it. Because you cannot get around a life change story and you cannot get around the truth of the revelation of God's word being taught and not be changed. It's not possible. Y'all looking at me like you don't believe me. It worked on you, didn't it? See, there was a moment you thought, I can't change. See, there was a moment you thought, I can't be free. There was a moment when you thought your drug addiction would not disappear. See, there, were, there, there was a moment in your life you thought your marriage couldn't be healed. There was a moment in your life you're bonded, you thought you couldn't be broken. Look at you now. Look where you're at. And my goodness, if God can do it for you, because some of you were messed up. Now, I, I'm being funny, but think about that. The Bible said God's not a respecter of people. He's a respecter of faith. And what he did for one, he can do for another. Amen? Listen to this statement. Who might you, over the next few months, who might you say, God? because the Colossians says this, it says to ask that God will give us an opportunity. When's the last time we said, God, put somebody in my path. Put me in the path of somebody. Listen to this statement. We're not asking you to invite the whole world. We're asking you to make an invitation that can change someone's world. That's where you go, ooh. I, thought, I must have thought that was more awesome than you did. Right, let me, I'll read it with dramatic effect. Here we go, listen. We're not asking you to invite the whole world. We're asking you to make an invitation that could change someone's world. I, I have an opinion that when it's all said and done, one of the most important things that matters is how well your story impacted or influenced other people. And when we stand before God, all the stuff we want to drag along with us won't be there except for the people that we were influencing that received Jesus. Jesus. That's the most important thing we can bring to heaven. Amen?